Section twenty four of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, chapter twenty one, part one. In spite of that unwanted note of pessimism from Mr. Watling, I went home in a day or two flushed with my new honours and it was impossible not to be conscious of the fact that my aura of prestige was increased tremendously increased by the recognition i had received a certain subtle deference in the attitude of the small minority who owed allegiance to the personage by whom i had been summoned was more satisfying than if i had been acclaimed at the station by thousands of my fellow-citizens who knew nothing of my journey and of its significance even though it might have a concern for them to men like beringer grierson and talent and our lesser great lights the banker was a semi-mythical figure and many times on the day of my return i was stopped on the street to satisfy the curiosity of my friends as to my impressions had he for instance let fall any opinions prognostications on the political and financial situation dickinson and scherer were the only other men in the city who had the honour of a personal acquaintance with him and scherer was away abroad gathering furniture and pictures for the house in new york nancy had predicted and which he had already begun to build with dickinson i lunched in private in order to give him a detailed account of the conference by five o'clock i was ringing the doorbell of nancy's new mansion on grant avenue it was several blocks below my own well how does it feel to be sent for by the great sultan she asked as i stood before her fire of course i have always known that ultimately he couldn't get along without you even if he has been a little late in realizing it i retorted sit down and tell me all about it she commanded i met him once when ham had the yacht at bar harbor and how did he strike you as somewhat wrapped up in himself said nancy we laughed together oh i fell a victim she went on i might have sailed off with him if he had asked me i'm surprised he didn't ask you i suspect that it was not quite convenient she said women are secondary considerations to sultans we're all very well when they haven't anything more serious to occupy them of course that's why they fascinate us what did he want with you hugh he was evidently afraid that the government would win the coal road suit unless i was retained more laurels she sighed i suppose i ought to be proud to know you that's exactly what i've been trying to impress on you all these years i declared i've laid the laurels at your feet in vain she sat with her head back on the cushions surveying me your dress is very becoming i said irrelevantly i hoped it would meet your approval she mocked i've been trying to identify the shade it's elusive like you don't be banal what is the colour poinsettia pretty nearly she agreed critically i took the soft crepe between my fingers poet she smiled no it isn't quite poinsettia it's nearer the red orange of a tree i remember one autumn on the white mountains with the sun setting on it but that wasn't what we were talking about laurels your laurels my laurels i repeated such as they are i fling them into your lap do you think they increase your value to me hugh i don't know i said thickly she shook her head no it's you i like not the laurels but if you care for me i began she lifted up her hands and folded them behind the knot of her hair it's extraordinary how little you have changed since we were children hugh you are still sixteen years old that's why i like you 
if you got to be the sultan of sultans yourself i shouldn't like you any better or any worse and yet you have just declared that power appeals to you power yes but a woman a woman like me wants to be first or nothing you are first i asserted you always have been if you had only realized it she gazed up at me dreamily if you had only realized it if you had only realized that all i wanted of you was to be yourself it wasn't what you achieved i didn't want you to be like ralph or the others myself what are you trying to say yourself yes that is what i like about you if you hadn't been in such a hurry if you hadn't misjudged me so it was the power in you the craving the ideal in you that i cared for not the fruits of it the fruits would have come naturally but you forced them hugh for quicker results what kind of fruits i asked ah she exclaimed how can i tell what they might have been you have striven and striven you have done extraordinary things but have they made you any happier have you got what you want i stooped down and seized her wrists from behind her head i want you nancy i said i have always wanted you you are more wonderful to-day than you have ever been i could find myself with you she closed her eyes a dreamy smile was on her face and she lay unresisting very still in that tremendous moment for which it seemed i had waited a lifetime i could have taken her in my arms and yet i did not i could not tell why perhaps it was because she seemed to have passed beyond me far beyond in realization and she was so still we've missed the way hugh she whispered at last but we can find it again if we seek it together i urged ah if i only could she said i could have once but now i'm afraid afraid of getting lost slowly she straightened up her hands falling into her lap i seized them again i was on my knees in front of her before the fire and she intent looking down at me into me through me it seemed at something beyond which yet was me hugh she asked what do you believe anything what do i believe yes i don't mean any can't cut and dried morality the world is getting beyond that but have you in your secret soul any religion at all do you ever think about it i'm not speaking about anything orthodox but some religion even a tiny speck of it a germ harmonizing with life with that power we feel in us we seek to express and continually violate nancy i exclaimed answer me answer me truthfully she said i was silent my thoughts whirling like dust atoms in a storm you have always taken things taken what you wanted but they haven't satisfied you convinced you that that is all of life do you mean that we should renounce i faltered i don't know what i mean i'm asking you asking haven't you any clue isn't there any voice in you anywhere deep down that can tell me give me a hint just a little one i was racked my passion had not left me it seemed to be heightened and i pressed her hands against her knees it was incredible that my hands should be there in hers feeling her her beauty seemed as fresh as unwasted as the day long since when i despaired of her and yet and yet against the tumult and beating of this passion striving to throb down thought thought strove though i saw her as a woman my senses and my spirit 
commingled and swooned together this is life i murmured scarcely knowing what i said oh my dear she cried and her voice pierced me with pain are we to be lost overpowered engulfed swept down its stream to come up below drifting wreckage where then would be your power i'm not speaking of myself isn't life more than that isn't it in us too in you thank you is there no god anywhere but this force we feel restlessly creating only to destroy you must answer you must find out i cannot describe the pleading passion in her voice as though hell and heaven were wrestling in it the woman i saw tortured yet uplifted did not seem to be nancy yet it was the woman i loved more than life itself and always had loved i can't think i answered desperately i can only feel and i can't express what i feel it's mixed it's dim and yet bright and shining it's you no it's you she said vehemently you must interpret it her voice sank could it be god she asked god i exclaimed sharply her hands fell away from mine the silence was broken only by the crackling of the wood fire as a log turned over and fell never before in all our intercourse that i could remember had she spoken to me about religion with that apparent snap in continuity incomprehensible to the masculine mind her feminine mood had changed elements i had never suspected in nancy awe even a hint of despair entered into it and when my hand found hers again the very quality of its convulsive pressure seemed to have changed i knew then that it was her soul i loved most i had been swept all unwittingly to its very altar i believe it is god i said but she continued to gaze at me her lips parted her eyes questioning why is it she demanded that after all these centuries of certainty we should have to start out to find him again why is it when something happens like like this that we should suddenly be torn with doubts about him when we have lived the best part of our lives without so much as thinking of him why should you have qualms i said isn't this enough and doesn't it promise all i don't know they're not qualms in the old sense she smiled down at me a little tearfully hugh do you remember when we used to go to sunday school at dr pound's church and mrs ewan taught us i really believed something then that moses brought down the ten commandments of god from the mountain all written out definitely for ever and ever and i used to think of marriage i felt a sharp twinge of marriage as something sacred and inviolable something ordained by god himself it ought to be so oughtn't it that is the ideal yes but aren't you confusing i began i am confusing and confused i shouldn't be i shouldn't care if there weren't something in you and me and our friendship something i can't explain something that shines still through the fog and the smoke in which we have lived our lives something which i think we saw clearer as children we have lost it in our hasty groping oh hugh i couldn't bear to think that we should never find it that it doesn't really exist because i seem to feel it but can we find it this way my dear her hand tightened on mine but if the force drawing us together that has always drawn us together is god i objected 
i asked you she said the time must come when you must answer hugh it may be too late but you must answer i believe in taking life in my own hands i said it ought to be life said nancy it it might have been life it is only when a moment a moment like this comes that the quality of what we have lived seems so tarnished that the atmosphere which we ourselves have helped to make is so sordid when i think of the intrigues and forces the self-indulgences when i think of my own marriage her voice caught how are we going to better it hugh this way am i to get that part of you i love and are you to get what you crave in me can we just seize happiness will it not elude us just as much as though we believed firmly in the ten commandments no i declared obstinately she shook her head what i'm afraid of is that the world isn't made that way for you for me we're permitted to seize those other things because they're just baubles we've both found out how worthless they are and the worst part of it is they've made me a coward hugh it isn't that i couldn't do without them i've come to depend on them in another way it's because they give me a certain protection do you see they've come to stand in the place of the real convictions we've lost and well we've taken the baubles can we reach out our hands and take this won't we be punished for it frightfully punished i don't care if we are i said and surprised myself but i care it's weak it's cowardly but it's so and yet i want to face the situation i'm trying to get you to face it to realize how terrible it is i only know that i want you above everything else in the world i'll take care of you i seized her arms i drew her down to me don't she cried oh don't and struggled to her feet and stood before me panting you must go away now please hugh i can't bear any more i want to think i released her she sank into the chair and hid her face in her hands as may be imagined the incident i have just related threw my life into a tangle that would have floored a less persistent optimist and romanticist than myself yet i became fairly accustomed to treading what the old moralist called the devious paths of sin in my passion i had not hesitated to lay down the doctrine that the courageous and the strong took what they wanted a doctrine of which i had been a consistent disciple in the professional and business realm a logical buccaneer superman master of life would promptly have extended the doctrine to the realm of sex nancy was the mate for me and nancy and i our development was all that mattered especially my development let every man and woman look out for his or her development and in the end the majority of people would be happy this was going adam smith one better when it came to putting that theory into practice however one needed convictions nancy had been right when she had implied that convictions were precisely what we lacked what our world in general lacked we had desires yes convictions no what we wanted we got not by defying the world but by conforming to it we were ready to defy only when our desires overcame the resistance of our synopses and even then not until we should have exhausted every legal and conventional means a superman with a wife and family he had acquired before a great passion has made him a superman is in rather a predicament especially if he be one who has achieved such superhumanity as he possesses not by challenging laws and conventions but by getting around them my wife and family loved me and paradoxically i still had affection for them 
or thought i had but the superman creed is be yourself realize yourself no matter how cruel you may have to be in order to do so one trouble with me was that remnants of the christian element of pity still clung to me i would be cruel if i had to but i hoped i shouldn't have to something would turn up something in the nature of an intervening miracle that would make it easy for me perhaps maude would take the initiative and relieve me nancy had appealed for a justifying doctrine and it was just what i didn't have and couldn't evolve in the meantime it was quite in character that i should accommodate myself to a situation that might well be called anomalous this accommodation was not unaccompanied by fever my longing to realize my love for nancy kept me in a constant state of tension of nerves for our relationship had merely gone one step farther we had reached a point where we acknowledged that we loved each other and paradoxically halted there nancy clung to her demand for new sanctions with a tenacity that amazed and puzzled and often irritated me and yet when i look back upon it all i can see that some of the difficulty lay with me if she had her weakness which she acknowledged i had mine and kept it to myself it was part of my romantic nature not to want to break her down perhaps i loved the ideal better than the woman herself though that scarcely seems possible we saw each other constantly and though we had instinctively begun to be careful i imagine there was some talk among our acquaintances it is to be noted that the gossip never became riotous for we had always been friends and nancy had a saving reputation for coldness it seemed incredible that maude had not discovered my secret but if she knew of it she gave no sign of her knowledge often as i looked at her i wished she would i can think of no more expressive sentence in regard to her than the trite one that she pursued the even tenor of her way and i found the very perfection of her wifehood exasperating our relationship would i thought have been more endurable if we had quarrelled and yet we had grown as far apart in that big house as though we had been separated by a continent i lived in my apartments she in hers she consulted me about dinner parties and invitations for since we had moved to grant avenue we entertained and went out more than before it seemed as though she were making every effort consistent with her integrity and self-respect to please me outwardly she conformed to the mould but i had long been aware that inwardly a person had developed it had not been a spontaneous development but one in resistance to pressure and was probably all the stronger for that reason at times her will revealed itself in astonishing and unexpected flashes as when once she announced that she was going to change matthew's school he's old enough to go to boarding school i said i'll look up a place for him i don't wish him to go to boarding school yet hugh she said quietly but that's just what he needs i objected he ought to have the rubbing up against other boys that boarding school will give him matthew is timid he should have learned to take care of himself and he will make friendships that will help him in a larger school i don't intend to send him maude said but if i think it wise you ought to have begun to consider such things many years ago you have always been too busy to think of the children you have left them to me i am doing the best i can with them but a man should have something to say about boys he understands them you should have thought of that before they haven't been old enough if you had taken your share of responsibility for them i would listen to you maud i exclaimed reproachfully no hugh she went on 
you have been too busy making money you have left them to me it is my task to see that the money they are to inherit doesn't ruin them you talk as though it were a great fortune i said but i did not press the matter i had a presentiment that to press it might lead to unpleasant results it was this sense of not being free of having gained everything but freedom that was at times galling in the extreme this sense of living with a woman for whom i had long ceased to care a woman with a baffling will concealed beneath an unruffled and serene exterior at moments i looked at her across the table she did not seem to have aged much her complexion was as fresh apparently as the day when i had first walked with her in the garden at elkington her hair the same wonderful colour perhaps she had grown a little stouter there could be no doubt about the fact that her chin was firmer that certain lines had come into her face indicative of what is called character beneath her pliability she was now all firmness the pliability had become a mockery it cannot be said that i went so far as to hate her for this when it was in my mind but my feelings were of a strong antipathy and then again there are rare moments when i was inexplicably drawn to her not by love and passion i melted a little in pity perhaps when my eyes were opened and i saw the tragedy yet i am not referring now to such feelings as these i am speaking of the times when i beheld her as the blameless companion of the years the mother of my children the woman i was used to and should by all canons i had known have loved and there were the children days and weeks passed when i scarcely saw them and then some little incident would happen to give me an unexpected wrench and plunge me into unhappiness one evening i came home from a long talk with nancy that had left us both wrought up and i had entered the library before i heard voices maud was seated under the lamp at the end of the big room reading from don quixote matthew and biddy were at her feet and morton less attentive at a little distance was taking apart a mechanical toy i would have tiptoed out but biddy caught sight of me it's father she cried getting up and flying to me oh father do come and listen the story's so exciting isn't it matthew i looked down into the boy's eyes shining with an expression that suddenly pierced my heart with a poignant memory of myself matthew was far away among the mountains and castles of spain matthew demanded his sister why did he want to go fighting with all those people because he was dotty supplied morton who had an interesting habit of picking up slang it wasn't at all cried matthew indignantly interrupting maud's rebuke of his brother what was it then morton demanded you wouldn't understand if i told you matthew was retorting when maud put her hand on his lips i think that's enough for to-night she said as she closed the book there are lessons to do and father wants to read his newspaper in quiet this brought a protest from biddy just a little more mother can't we go into the schoolroom we shan't disturb father there i'll read to them a few minutes i said as i took the volume from her and sat down maud shot at me a swift look of surprise even matthew glanced at me curiously and in his glance i had as it were a sudden revelation of the boy's perplexity concerning me he was twelve rather tall for his age and the delicate modelling of his face resembled my father's he had begun to think what did he think of me biddy clapped her hands and began to dance across the carpet father's going to read to us father's going to read to us she cried finally clambering up on my knee and snuggling against me where's the place i asked 
but maude had left the room she had gone swiftly and silently i'll find it said morton i began to read but i scarcely knew what i was reading my fingers tightening over biddy's little knee presently miss alsop the governess came in she had been sent by maude there was wistfulness in biddy's voice as i kissed her good-night father if you would only read oftener she said i like it when you read better than any one else maude and i were alone that night as we sat in the library after our somewhat formal perfunctory dinner i ventured to ask her why she had gone away when i had offered to read i couldn't bear it hugh she answered why i asked intending to justify myself she got up abruptly and left me i did not follow her in my heart i understood why End of section 24section 25 of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book three chapter twenty one part two some years had passed since ralph's prophecy had come true and perry and the remaining blackwoods had been relieved of the boyne street line the process need not be gone into in detail being the time-honoured one employed in the ribblevale affair of running down the line or perhaps it would be better to say showing it up it had not justified its survival in our efficient days it had held out thanks to perry with absurd and anachronous persistence against the inevitable consolidation mr tallant's newspaper had published many complaints of the age and scarcity of the cars etc and alarmed holders of securities in whose vaults they had lain since time immemorial began to sell i saw little of perry in those days as i have explained but one day i met him in the hambleton building and he was white your friends are doing this hugh he said doing what undermining the reputation of a company as sound as any in this city a company that's not overcapitalized either and we're giving better service right now than any of your consolidated lines he was in no frame of mind to argue with the conversation was distinctly unpleasant i don't remember what i said something to the effect that he was excited that his language was extravagant but after he had walked off and left me i told dickinson that he ought to be given a chance and one of our younger financiers murphy went to perry and pointed out that he had nothing to gain by obstruction if he were only reasonable he might come into the new corporation on the same terms with the others all that murphy got for his pains was to be ordered out of the office by perry who declared that he was being bribed to desert the other stockholders he utterly failed to see the point of view murphy reported in some astonishment to dickinson what else did he say mr dickinson asked murphy hesitated well what the banker insisted he wasn't quite himself said murphy who was a comparative newcomer in the city and had a respect for the blackwood name he said that that was the custom of thieves when they were discovered they offered to divide he swore that he would get justice in the courts mr dickinson smiled thus perry through his obstinacy and inability to adapt himself to new conditions had gradually lost both caste and money he resigned from the boyne club i was rather sorry for him tom naturally took the matter to heart but he never spoke of it i found that i was seeing less of him though we continued to dine there at intervals and he still came to my house to see the children maude continued to see lucia for me the situation would have been more awkward had i been less occupied had my relationship with maude been a closer one neither did she mention perry in those days the income that remained to him being sufficient for him and his family to live on comfortably 
he began to devote most of his time to various societies of a semi-public nature until in the spring of which i write his activities suddenly became concentrated in the organization of a citizens union whose avowed object was to make a campaign against graft and political corruption the following autumn this announcement and the call for a mass meeting in kingdon hall was received by the newspapers with a good-natured ridicule and in influential quarters it was generally hinted that this was mr blackwood's method of getting square for having been deprived of the boyne street line it was quite characteristic of ralph hambleton that he should go out of curiosity to the gathering at kingdon hall and drop into my office the next morning well hugh they're after you he said with a grin after me why not include yourself he sat down and stretched his long legs and his long arms and smiled as he gaped oh they'll never get me he said and i knew as i gazed at him that they never would what sort of things did they say i asked haven't you read the pilot and the mail and state i just glanced over them did they all call names call names i should say they did they got drunk on it worked themselves up like dervishes they didn't cuss you personally that'll come later of course judd jason got the heaviest shot but they said he couldn't exist a minute if it wasn't for the respectable crowd capitalists financiers millionaires and their legal tools fact is they spoke a good deal of truth first and last in a fool kind of way truth i exclaimed irritatedly ralph laughed he was evidently enjoying himself is any of it news to you hughie old boy it's an outrage i think it's funny said ralph we haven't had such a circus for years never had of course i shouldn't like to see you go behind the bars not that but you fellows can't expect to go on forever skimming off the cream without having somebody squeal some time you ought to be reasonable you've skimmed as much cream as anybody else you've skimmed the cream hughie you and dickinson and scherer and grierson and the rest i've only filled my jug well these fellows are going to have a regular roof-raising campaign take the lid off of everything dump out the red light district some of our friends are so fond of dump it where i asked curiously oh answered ralph they didn't say out into the country anywhere but that's damned foolishness i declared didn't say it wasn't ralph admitted they talked a lot of that too incidentally they're going to close the saloons and dance halls and make this city sadder than heaven when they get through it'll all be over but the inquest what did perry do i asked well he opened the meeting made a nice precise gentlemanly speech greenhalge and a few young highbrows and a reformed crook named harrod did most of the hair-raising they're going to nominate greenhalge for mayor and he told them something about that little matter of the school board and said he would talk more later on if one of the ablest lawyers in the city hadn't been hired by the respectable crowd and a lot of other queer work done the treasurer and purchasing agent would be doing time they seemed to be interested all right i turned over some papers on my desk just to show ralph that he hadn't succeeded in disturbing me who was in the audience anyone you ever heard of i asked sure thing your cousin robert brack and that son-in-law of his what's his name and some other representatives of our older families alec pound he's a reformer now you know they put him on the resolutions committee sam ogilvy was there he'd be classed as respectably conservative and one of the owenses i could name a few others if you pressed me that brother of founds who looks like an upstate minister a lot of women miller gorse's sister mrs datchet who never approved of miller quite a genteel gathering i give you my word and all astonished and mad as hell when the speaking was over 
mrs datchet said she had been living in a den of iniquity and vice and didn't know it it must have been amusing i said it was said ralph it'll be more amusing later on oh yes there was another fellow who spoke i forgot to mention that queer dick who was in your class krebs got the school board evidence looked as if he'd come in by freight he wasn't as popular as the rest but he's got more sense than all of them put together why wasn't he popular well he didn't crack up the american people said they deserved all they got that they'd have to learn to think straight and be straight before they could expect a square deal the truth was they secretly envied these rich men who were exploiting their city and just as long as they envied them they hadn't any right to complain of them he was going into the campaign to tell the truth but to tell all sides of it and if they wanted reform they'd have to reform themselves first i admire his nerve i must say he always had that i remarked how did they take it well they didn't like it much but i think most of them had a respect for him i know i did he has a whole lot of assurance an air of knowing what he's talking about and apparently he doesn't give a continental whether he's popular or not besides greenhalge had cracked him up to the skies for the work he'd done for the school board you talk as if he'd converted you i said ralph laughed as he rose and stretched himself oh i'm only the intelligent spectator you ought to know that by this time hughie but i thought it might interest you since you'll have to go on the stump and refute it all that'll be a nice job so long and he departed of course i knew that he had been baiting me his scent for the weaknesses of his friends being absolutely fiendish i was angry because he had succeeded because he knew he had succeeded all the morning uneasiness possessed me and i found it difficult to concentrate on the affairs i had in hand i felt premonitions which i tried in vain to suppress that the tide of the philosophy of power and might were starting to ebb i scented vague calamities ahead calamities i associated with krebs and when i went out to the club for lunch this sense of uneasiness instead of being dissipated was increased dickinson was there and scherer who had just got back from europe the talk fell on the citizens union which scherer belittled with an air of consequence and pompousness that struck me disagreeably and with an eye newly critical i detected in him a certain disintegration deterioration having dismissed the reformers he began to tell of his experiences abroad referring in one way or another to the people of consequence who had entertained him who said leonard dickinson to me as we walked to the bank together scherer will never be any good any more too much prosperity and he's begun to have his nails manicured after i had left the bank president an uncanny fancy struck me that in adolf scherer i had before me a concrete example of the effect of my philosophy on the individual nothing seemed to go right that spring and yet nothing was absolutely wrong at times i became irritated bewildered out of tune and unable to understand why the weather itself was uneasy tepid with long spells of hot wind and dust i no longer seemed to find refuge in my work i was unhappy at home after walking for many years in confidence and security along what appeared to be a certain path i had suddenly come out into a vague country in which it was becoming more and more difficult to recognize landmarks i did not like to confess this and yet i heard within me occasional whispers could it be that i hugh parrot who had always been so positive had made a mess of my life there were moments when the pattern of it appeared to have fallen apart resolved itself into pieces that refused to fit into each other of course my relationship with nancy had something to do with this one evening 
late in the spring after dinner maude came into the library are you busy hugh she asked i put down my newspapers because she went on as she took a chair near the table where i was writing i wanted to tell you that i've decided to go to europe and take the children to europe i exclaimed the significance of the announcement failed at once to register in my brain but i was aware of a shock yes when i asked right away the end of the month for the summer i haven't decided how long i shall stay i stared at her in bewilderment in contrast to the agitation i felt rising within me she was extraordinarily calm unbelievably so but where do you intend to go in europe i shall go to london for a month or so and after that to some quiet place in france probably at the sea where the children can learn french and german after that i have no plans but you talk as if you might stay indefinitely i haven't decided she repeated but why why are you doing this i would have recalled the words as soon as i had spoken them there was the slightest unsteadiness in her voice as she replied is it necessary to go into that hugh wouldn't it be useless as well as a little painful surely going to europe without one's husband is not an unusual thing in these days let it just be understood that i want to go that the children have arrived at an age when it will do them good i got up and began to walk up and down the room while she watched me with a silent calm which was incomprehensible in vain i summoned my faculties to meet it i had not thought her capable of such initiative i can't see why you want to leave me i said at last though with a full sense of the inadequacy of the remark and a suspicion of its hypocrisy that isn't quite true she answered in the first place you don't need me i'm not of the slightest use in your life i haven't been a factor in it for years you ought never to have married me it was all a terrible mistake i began to realize that after we'd been married a few months even when we were on our wedding trip but i was too inexperienced perhaps too weak to acknowledge it to myself in the last few years i have come to see it plainly i should have been a fool if i hadn't i am not your wife in any real sense of the word i cannot hold you i cannot even interest you it's a situation that no woman with self-respect can endure aren't those rather modern sentiments for you maud i said she flushed a little but otherwise retained her remarkable composure i don't care whether they're modern or not i only know that my position has become impossible i walked to the other end of the room and stood facing the carefully drawn curtains of the windows fantastically they seemed to represent the impasse to which my mind had come did she intend ultimately to get a divorce i dared not ask her the word rang horribly in my ears though unpronounced and i knew then that i lacked her courage and the knowledge was part of my agony i turned don't you think you've overdrawn things maud exaggerated them no marriages are perfect you've let your mind dwell until it has become inflamed on matters which really don't amount to much i was never saner hugh she replied instantly and indeed i was forced to confess that she looked it that new maud i had seen emerging of late years seemed now to have found herself she was no longer the woman i had married yielding willing to overlook anxious to please living in me i don't influence you or help you in any way i never have oh that's not true i protested but she cut me short going on inexorably i am merely your housekeeper and rather a poor one at that from your point of view you ignore me i'm not blaming you for it you are made that way 
it's true that you have always supported me in luxury that might have been enough for another woman it isn't enough for me i too have a life to live a soul to be responsible for it's not for my sake so much as for the children's that i don't want it to be crushed crushed i repeated yes you are stifling it i say again that i'm not blaming you hugh you are made differently from me all you care for really is your career you may think that you care at times for other things but it isn't so i took involuntarily a deep breath would she mention nancy was it in reality nancy who had brought about this crisis and did maude suspect the closeness of that relationship suddenly i found myself begging her not to go the more astonishing since if at any time during the past winter this solution had presented itself to me as a possibility i should eagerly have welcomed it but should i ever have had the courage to propose a separation i even wished to delude myself now into believing that what she suggested was in reality not a separation i preferred to think of it as a trip a vision of freedom thrilled me and yet i was racked and torn i had an idea that she was suffering that the ordeal was a terrible one for her and at that moment there crowded into my mind melting me incident after incident of our past it seems to me that we've got along pretty well together maud i have been negligent i'll admit it but i'll try to do better in the future and if you'll wait a month or so i'll go to europe with you and we'll have a good time she looked at me sadly pityingly i thought no hugh i've thought it all out you really don't want me you only say this because you are sorry for me because you dislike to have your feelings wrung you needn't be sorry for me i shall be much happier away from you think it over maud i pleaded i shall miss you and the children i haven't paid much attention to them either but i am fond of them and depend upon them too she shook her head it's no use hugh i tell you i've thought it all out you don't care for the children you were never meant to have any aren't you rather severe in your judgments i don't think so she answered i'm willing to admit my faults that i am a failure so far as you are concerned your ideas of life and mine are far apart i suppose i exclaimed bitterly that you are referring to my professional practices a note of weariness crept into her voice i might have known that she was near the end of her strength no i don't think it's that she said dispassionately i prefer to put it down that part of it to a fundamental difference of ideas i do not feel qualified to sit in judgment on that part of your life although i'll admit that many of the things you have done in common with the men with whom you are associated have seemed to me unjust and inconsiderate of the rights and feelings of others you have shamed some of your best friends if i were to arraign you at all it would be on the score of heartlessness but i suppose it isn't your fault that you haven't any heart that's unfair i put in i don't wish to be unfair she replied only since you ask me i have to tell you that that is the way it seems to me i don't want to introduce the questions of right and wrong into this hue i'm not capable of unravelling it i can't put myself into your life and see things from your point of view weigh your problems and difficulties in the first place you won't let me i think i understand you partly but only partly you have kept yourself shut up but why discuss it i have made up my mind the legal aspect of the matter occurred to me what right had she to leave me i might refuse to support her yet even as these thoughts came i rejected them i knew that it was not in me to press this point and she could always take refuge with her father 
without the children of course but the very notion sickened me i could not bear to think of maude deprived of the children i had seated myself again at the table i put my hand to my forehead don't make it hard hugh i heard her say gently believe me it is best i know there won't be any talk about it right away at any time people will think it natural that i should wish to go abroad for the summer and later well the point of view about such affairs has changed they are better understood she had risen she was pale still outwardly composed but i had a strange hideous feeling that she was weeping inwardly aren't you coming back ever i cried she did not answer at once i don't know she said i don't know and left the room abruptly i wanted to follow her but something withheld me i got up and walked around the room in a state of mind that was near to agony taking one of the neglected books out of the shelves glancing at its meaningless print and replacing it i stirred at the fire opened the curtains and gazed out into the street and closed them again i looked around me a sudden intensity of hatred seized me for the big silent luxurious house i recalled maude's presentiment about it then thinking i might still dissuade her i went slowly up the padded stairway to find her door locked and the sense of the finality of her decision came over me i knew then that i could not alter it even were i to go all the lengths of abjectness nor could i i knew have brought myself to have feigned a love i did not feel what was it i felt i could not define it amazement for one thing that maude with her traditional christian view of marriage should have come to such a decision i went to my room undressed mechanically and got into bed she gave no sign at the breakfast-table of having made the decision of the greatest moment in our lives she conversed as usual asked about the news reproved the children for being noisy and when the children had left the table there were no tears reminiscences recriminations in spite of the slight antagonism and envy of which i was conscious that she was thus superbly in command of the situation that she had developed her pinions and was thus splendidly able to use them my admiration for her had never been greater i made an effort to achieve the frame of mind she suggested since she took it so calmly why should i be tortured by the tragedy of it perhaps she had ceased to love me after all perhaps she felt nothing but relief at any rate i was grateful to her and i found a certain consolation a sop to my pride in the reflection that the initiative must have been hers to take i could not have deserted her when do you think of leaving i asked two weeks from saturday on the olympic if that is convenient for you her manner seemed one of friendly solicitude you will remain in the house this summer as usual i suppose yes i said it was a sunny warm morning and i went downtown in the motor almost blithely it was the best solution after all and i had been a fool to oppose it at the office there was much business awaiting me yet once in a while during the day when the tension relaxed the recollection of what had happened flowed back into my consciousness maude was going i had telephoned nancy making an appointment for the afternoon sometimes not too frequently we were in the habit of going out into the country in one of her motors a sort of landaulet i believe in which we were separated from the chauffeur by a glass screen she was waiting for me when i arrived at four and as soon as we had shot clear of the city maude is going away i told her going away she repeated struck more by the tone of my voice than by what i had said she announced last night that she was going abroad indefinitely 
i had been more than anxious to see how nancy would take the news a flush gradually deepened in her cheeks you mean that she's going to leave you it looks that way in fact she as much as said so why said nancy well she explained it pretty thoroughly apparently it isn't a sudden decision i replied trying to choose my words to speak composedly as i repeated the gist of our conversation nancy with her face averted listened in silence a silence that continued some time after i had ceased to speak she didn't she didn't mention the sentence remained unfinished no i said quickly she didn't she must know of course but i'm sure that didn't enter into it nancy's eyes as they returned to me were wet and in them was an expression i had never seen before of pain reproach of questioning it frightened me oh hugh how little you know she cried what do you mean i demanded that is what has brought her to this decision you and i you mean that that maud loves me that she is jealous i don't know how i managed to say it no woman likes to think she is a failure murmured nancy well but she isn't really i insisted she could have made another man happy a better man it was all one of those terrible mistakes our modern life seems to emphasize so she is a woman nancy said with what seemed a touch of vehemence it's useless to expect you to understand do you remember what i said to you about her how i appealed to you when you married to try to appreciate her it wasn't that i didn't appreciate her i interrupted surprised that nancy should have recalled this she isn't the woman for me we aren't made for each other it was my mistake my fault i admit but i don't agree with you at all that we had anything to do with her decision it is just the the culmination of a long period of incompatibility she has come to realize that she has only one life to live and she seems happier more composed more herself than she ever has been since our marriage of course i don't mean to say it isn't painful for her but i am sure she isn't well that it isn't because of our seeing one another i concluded haltingly she is finer than either of us hugh far finer i did not relish the statement she's fine i admit but i can't see how under the circumstances any of us could have acted differently and nancy not replying i continued she has made up her mind to go i suppose i could prevent it by taking extreme measures but what good would it do isn't it after all the most sensible the only way out of a situation that has become impossible times have changed nancy and you yourself have been the first to admit it marriage is no longer what it was and people are coming to look upon it more sensibly in order to perpetuate the institution as it was segregation insulation was the only course men segregated their wives women their husbands the only logical method of procedure but it limited the individual our mothers and fathers thought it scandalous if husband or wife paid visits alone it wasn't done but our modern life has changed all that a marriage to be a marriage should be proof against disturbing influences should have the individuals free the binding element should be love not the force of an imposed authority you seemed to agree to all this yes i know she admitted but i cannot think that happiness will ever grow out of unhappiness but maud will not be unhappy i insisted she will be happier far happier now that she has taken the step oh i wish i thought so nancy exclaimed hugh you always believe what you want to believe and the children how can you bear to part with them 
i was torn i had a miserable sense of inadequacy i shall miss them i said i've never really appreciated them i admit i don't deserve to have them and i am willing to give them up for you for maude we had made one of our favourite drives among the hills on the far side of the ashuela and at six were back at nancy's house i did not go in but walked slowly homeward up grant avenue it had been a trying afternoon i had not expected indeed that nancy would have rejoiced but her attitude her silences betraying as they did compunctions seemed to threaten our future happiness end of section twenty five section twenty six of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book three chapter twenty two one evening two or three days later i returned from the office to gaze up at my house to realize suddenly that it would be impossible for me to live there in those great empty rooms alone and i told maude that i would go to the club during her absence i preferred to keep up the fiction that her trip would only be temporary she forbore from contradicting me devoting herself efficiently to the task of closing the house making it seem somehow a right the final right in her capacity as housewife the drawing-room was shrouded and the library the books wrapped neatly in paper a smell of camphor pervaded the place the cheerful schoolroom was dismantled trunks and travelling bags appeared the solemn butler packed my clothes and i arranged for a room at the club in the wing that recently had been added for the accommodation of bachelors and deserted husbands one of the ironies of those days was that the children began to suggest again possibilities of happiness i had missed especially matthew with all his gentleness the boy seemed to have a precocious understanding of the verities and the capacity for suffering which as a child i had possessed but he had more self-control though he looked forward to the prospect of new scenes and experiences with the anticipation natural to his temperament i thought he betrayed at moments a certain intuition as to what was going on when are you coming over father he asked once how soon will your business let you he had been brought up in the belief that my business was a tyrant oh soon matthew some time soon i said i had a feeling that he understood me not intellectually but emotionally what a companion he might have been morton and biddy moved me less they were more robust more normal more introspective and imaginative europe meant nothing to them but they were frankly delighted and excited at the prospect of going on the ocean asking dozens of questions about the great ship impatient to embark i shan't need all that hugh maude said when i handed her a letter of credit i i intend to live quite simply and my chief expenses will be the children's education i am going to give them the best of course of course i replied but i want you to live over there as you have been accustomed to live here it's not exactly generosity on my part i have enough and more than enough she took the letter another thing i'd rather you didn't go to new york with us hugh i know you are busy of course i'm going i started to protest no she went on firmly i'd rather you didn't the hotel people will put me on the steamer very comfortably and there are other reasons why i do not wish it i did not insist on the afternoon of her departure when i came up town i found her pinning some roses on her jacket perry and lucia sent them she informed me she maintained the friendly impersonal manner to the very end but my soul as we drove to the train was full of unprobed wounds 
i had had roses put in her compartments in the car tom and susan peters were there with more roses and little presents for the children their cheerfulness seemed forced and i wondered whether they suspected that maude's absence would be prolonged write us often and tell us all about it dear said susan as she sat beside maude and held her hand tom had biddy on his knee maude was pale but smiling and composed i hope to get a little villa in france near the sea she said i'll send you a photograph of it susan and chickabiddy when she comes back will be rattling off french like a native exclaimed tom giving her a hug i hate french said biddy and she looked at him solemnly i wish you were coming along uncle tom bells resounded through the great station the porter warned us off i kissed the children one by one scarcely realizing what i was doing i kissed maude she received my embrace passively good-bye hugh she said i alighted and stood on the platform as the train pulled out the children crowded to the windows but maud did not appear i found myself walking with tom and susan past hurrying travellers and porters to the decatur street entrance where my automobile stood waiting i'll take you home susan i said we're ever so much obliged to you she answered but the street cars go almost to perry's door we're dining there her eyes were filled with tears and she seemed taller more ungainly than ever older a sudden impression of her greatness of heart was borne home to me and i grasped the value of such rugged friendship as hers as tom's we shouldn't know how to behave in an automobile he said as though to soften her refusal and i stood watching their receding figures as they walked out into the street and hailed the huge electric car that came to a stop beyond them above its windows was painted the ashuela traction company a label reminiscent of my professional activities then i heard the chauffeur ask where do you wish to go sir to the club i said my room was ready my personal belongings my clothes had been laid out my photographs were on the dressing-table i took up mechanically the evening newspaper but i could not read it i thought of maud of the children memories flowed in upon me a flood not to be damned presently the club valet knocked at my door he had a dinner card will you be dining here sir he inquired i went downstairs fred grierson was the only man in the dining-room hello hugh he said come and sit down i hear your wife's gone abroad yes i answered she thought she'd try it instead of the south shore this summer perhaps i imagined that he looked at me queerly i had made a great deal of money out of my association with grierson i had valued very highly being an important member of the group to which he belonged but to-night as i watched him eating and drinking greedily i hated him even as i hated myself and after dinner when he started talking with a ridicule that was a thinly disguised bitterness about the citizens union and their preparations for a campaign i left him and went to bed before a week had passed my painful emotions had largely subsided and with my accustomed resiliency i had regained the feeling of self-respect so essential to my happiness i was free my only anxiety was for nancy who had gone to new york the day after my last talk with her and it was only by telephoning to her house that i discovered when she was expected to return i found her sitting beside one of the open french windows of her salon gazing across at the wooded hills beyond the ashuela she was serious a little pale more exquisite more desirable than ever but her manner implied the pressure of control and her voice was not quite steady as she greeted me you've been away a long time i said the dressmakers she answered her colour rose a little i thought they'd never get through but why didn't you drop me a line let me know when you were coming 
i asked taking a chair beside her and laying my hand on hers she drew it gently away what's the matter i asked i've been thinking it all over what we're doing it doesn't seem right it seems terribly wrong but i thought we'd gone over all that i replied as patiently as i could you're putting it on an old-fashioned moral basis but there must be some basis she urged there are responsibilities obligations there must be that we can't get away from i can't help feeling that we ought to stand by our mistakes and by our bargains we made a choice it's cheating somehow and if we take this what we want we shall be punished for it but i'm willing to be punished to suffer as i told you if you loved me hugh she exclaimed and i was silent you don't understand she went on a little breathlessly what i mean by punishment is deterioration do you remember once long ago when you came to me before i was married i said we'd both run after false gods and that we couldn't do without them well and now this has come it seems so wonderful to me coming again like that after we passed it by after we thought it had gone forever it's opened up visions for me that i never hope to see again it ought to restore us dear that's what i'm trying to say to redeem us to make us capable of being what we were meant to be if it doesn't do that if it isn't doing so it's the most horrible of travesties of mockeries if we gain life only to have it turn into death slow death if we go to pieces again utterly for now there's hope the more i think the more clearly i see that we can't take any step without responsibilities if we take this you'll have me and i'll have you and if we don't save each other but we will i said ha ah, she exclaimed if we could start new without any past i married ham with my eyes open you couldn't know that he would become well as flagrant as he is you didn't really know what he was then there's no reason why i shouldn't have anticipated it i can't claim that i was deceived that i thought my marriage was made in heaven i entered into a contract and ham has kept his part of it fairly well he hasn't interfered with my freedom that isn't putting it on a high plane but there is an obligation involved you yourself in your law practice are always insisting upon the sacredness of contract as a very basis of our civilization here indeed would have been a home thrust had i been vulnerable at the time so intent was i on overcoming her objections that i resorted unwittingly to the modern argument i had more than once declared in court to be anathema the argument of the new reform in reference to the common law and the constitution a contract no matter how seriously entered into at the time it was made that later is seen to violate the principles of humanity should be void and not only this but you didn't consent that he should disgrace you nancy winced i never told you that he paid my father's debts i never told any one she said in a low voice even then i answered after a moment you ought to see that it's too terrible a price to pay for your happiness and ham hasn't ever pretended to consider you in any way it's certain you didn't agree that he should do what he's doing suppose i admitted it she said there remain maud and your children their happiness their future becomes my responsibility as well as yours but i don't love maud and maud doesn't love me i grant it's my fault that i did her a wrong in marrying her but she is right in leaving me i should be doing her a double wrong and the children will be happy with her they will be well brought up i too have thought this out nancy i insisted and the fact is that in our respective marriages we have been each of us victims of our time of our education 
we were born in a period of transition we inherited views of life that do not fit conditions to-day it takes courage to achieve happiness initiative to emancipate oneself from a morality that begins to hamper and bind to stay as we are to refuse to take what is offered us is to remain between wind and water i don't mean that we should do anything hastily we can afford to take a reasonable time to be dignified about it but i have come to the conclusion that the only thing that matters in the world is a love like ours and its fulfilment achievement success are empty and meaningless without it and you do love me you've admitted it oh i don't want to talk about it she exclaimed desperately but we have to talk about it i persisted we have to thrash it out to see it straight as you yourself have said you speak of convictions hugh new convictions in place of the old we have discarded but what are there and is there no such thing as conscience even though it be only an intuition of happiness or unhappiness i do care for you i do love you then why not let that suffice i exclaimed leaning towards her she drew back but i want to respect you too she said i was shocked too shocked to answer i want to respect you she repeated more gently i don't want to think that that what we feel for each other is unconsecrated it consecrates itself i declared she shook her head surely it has its roots in everything that is fine in both of us we both went wrong said nancy we both sought to wrest power and happiness from the world to make our own laws how can we assert that this is not merely a continuation of it but can't we work out our beliefs together i demanded won't you trust me trust our love for one another her breath came and went quickly oh you know that i want you hugh as much as you want me and more the time may come when i can't resist you why do you resist me i cried seizing her hands convulsively and swept by a gust of passion at her confession try to understand that i am fighting for both of us she pleaded an appeal that wrung me in spite of the pitch to which my feelings had been raised hugh dear we must think it out don't now i let her hands drop beyond the range of hills rising from the far side of the ishwela was the wide valley in which was situated the cloverdale country club with its polo field golf course and tennis courts and in this same valley some of our wealthy citizens such as howard ogilvy and leonard dickinson had bought farms weekend playthings for spring and autumn Hamilton Durrett had started the fashion, capriciously as he did everything else. He had become the owner of several hundred acres of pasture, woodland, and orchard, acquired some seventy-five head of blooded stock, and proceeded to house them in model barns and milk by machinery. For several months he had bored everyone in the Boyne Club, whom he could entice into conversation on the subject of the records of pedigreed cows, and spent many bibulous nights on the farm in company with those parasites who surrounded him when he was in town. Then another interest had intervened, a feminine one, of course, and his energies were transferred, so we understood, to the reconstruction and furnishing of a little residence in New York, not far from Fifth Avenue. The farm continued under the expert direction of a superintendent, who was a graduate of the State Agricultural College, and a select clientele, which could afford to pay the prices, consumed the milk and cream and butter quite consistent with their marital relations was the fact that nancy should have taken a fancy to the place after ham's interest had waned 
not that she cared for the guernseys or jerseys or whatever they may have been she evinced a sudden passion for simplicity occasional simplicity at least for a contrast to and escape from a complicated life of luxury she built another house for the superintendent banished him from the little farmhouse where ham had kept two rooms banished along with the superintendent the stiff plush furniture the yellow-red carpets the easels and the melodeon and decked it out in bright chintzes with wallpapers to match dainty muslin curtains and rag carpet rugs on the hardwood floors the pseudo-classic porch over the doorway which had suggested a cemetery was removed and a wide piazza added furnished with wicker lounging chairs and tables and shaded with gay awnings here to the farm accompanied by a maid she had been in the habit of retiring from time to time and here she came in early july here dressed in the simplest linen gowns of pink or blue or white i found a nancy magically restored to girlhood a new nancy betraying only traces of the old a new nancy in a new eden we had all the setting all the illusion of that perfect ideal of domesticity love in a cottage nancy and i who all our lives had spurned simplicity laughed over the joy we found in it she made a high art of it of course we had our simple dinners which mrs olson cooked and served in the open air sometimes on the porch sometimes under the great butternut tree spreading its shade over what in a more elaborate country place would have been called a lawn an uneven plot of grass of ridges and hollows that ran down to the orchard nancy's eyes would meet mine across the little table and often our gaze would wander over the pastures below loosened green in the level evening light to the darkening woods beyond gilt tipped in the setting sun there were fields of ripening yellow grain of lusty young corn that grew almost as we watched it the warm winds of evening were heavy with the acrid odours of fecundity fecundity in that lay the elusive yet insistent charm of that country and nancy's of course was the transforming touch that made it paradise it was thus in the country i suggested that we should spend the rest of our existence what was the use of amassing money when happiness was to be had so simply how long do you think you could stand it she asked as she handed me a plate of blackberries forever with the right woman i announced how long could the woman stand it she humoured smilingly my crystal gazing into our future as though she had not the heart to deprive me of the pleasure i simply can't believe in it hugh she said when i pressed her for an answer why not i suppose it's because i believe in continuity i haven't the romantic temperament i always see the angel with the flaming sword it isn't that i want to see him but we shall redeem ourselves i said it won't be curiosity and idleness we are not just taking this thing and expecting to give nothing for it in return what can we give that is worth it she exclaimed with one of her revealing flashes we won't take it lightly but seriously i told her we shall find something to give and that something will spring naturally out of our love we'll read together and think and plan together oh hugh you are incorrigible was all she said the male tendency in me was forever strained to solve her to deduce from her conversation and conduct a body of consistent law the effort was useless here was a realm that of nancy's soul in which there was apparently no such thing as relevancy in the twilight after dinner we often walked through the orchard to a grassy bank beside the little stream where we would sit and watch the dying glow in the sky after a rain its swollen waters were turbid opaque yellow-red with the clay of the hills 
at other times it ran smoothly temperately almost clear between the pasture grasses and wild flowers nancy declared that it reminded her of me we sat there into the lush warm nights and the moon shone down on us or again through long silences we searched the bewildering starry chart of the heavens with the undertones of the night chorus of the fields in our ears sometimes she let my head rest upon her knee but when throbbing at her touch with the life force pulsing around us i tried to take her in my arms to bring her lips to mine she resisted me with an energy of will and body that i could not overcome i dared not overcome she acknowledged her love for me she permitted me to come to her she had the air of yielding but never yielded why then did she allow the words of love to pass and how draw the line between caresses i was maddened and disheartened by that elusive resistance in her apparently so frail a thing that neither argument nor importunity could break down was there something lacking in me or was it that i feared to mar or destroy the love she had this surely had not been the fashion of other loves called unlawful the classic instances celebrated by the poets of all ages rose to mock me incurably romantic she had called me in calmer moments when i was able to discuss our affair objectively and once she declared that i had no sense of tragedy we read macbeth together i remember one rainy sunday the modern world which was our generation would seem to be cut off from all that preceded it as with a descending knife it was precisely from the sense of tragedy that we had been emancipated from the agonized conscious i should undoubtedly have said had i been acquainted then with mr santayana's later phrase conscience the old kind of conscience and nothing inherent in the deeds themselves made the tragedy conscience was superstition the fear of the wrath of the gods conscience was the wrath of the gods eliminate it and behold there were no consequences the gods themselves that kind of gods became as extinct as the deities of the druids the greek fates the terrible figures of german mythology yes and as the god of christian orthodoxy had any dire calamities overtaken the modern macbeths of whose personal lives we happen to know something had not these great ones broken with impunity all the laws of traditional morality they ground the faces of the poor played golf and went to church with serene minds untroubled by criticism they appropriated quite freely other men's money and some of them other men's wives and yet they were not haggard with remorse the gods remained silent christian ministers regarded these modern transgressors of ancient laws benignly and accepted their contributions here indeed were the supermen of the mad german prophet and philosopher come to life refuting all classic tragedy it is true that some of these supermen were occasionally swept away by disease which in ancient days would have been regarded as a retributive scourge but was in fact nothing but the logical working of the laws of hygiene the results of overwork such though stated more crudely were my contentions when desire did not cloud my brain and make me incoherent and i did not fail to remind nancy constantly that this was the path on which her feet had been set that to waver now was to perish she smiled yet she showed concern but suppose you don't get what you want she objected what then suppose one doesn't become a superman or a superwoman what's to happen to one is there no god but the superman's god which is himself are there no gods for those who can't be supermen or for those who may refuse to be supermen to refuse i maintained were a weakness of the will but there are other wills she persisted wills over which the superman may conceivably have no control 
suppose for example that you don't get me that my will intervenes granting it to be conceivable that your future happiness and welfare as you insist depend upon your getting me which i doubt you've no reason to doubt it well granting it then suppose the orthodoxies and superstition succeed in inhibiting me i may not be a superwoman but my will or my conscience if you choose may be stronger than yours if you don't get what you want you aren't happy in other words you fail where are your gods then the trouble with you my dear hugh is that you have never failed she went on you've never had a good hard fall you've always been on the winning side and you've never had the world against you no wonder you don't understand the meaning and value of tragedy and you i asked no she agreed nor i yet i have come to feel instinctively that somehow concealed in tragedy is the central fact of life the true reality that nothing is to be got by dodging it as we have dodged it your superman at least the kind of superman you portray is petrified something vital in him that should be plastic and sensitive has turned to stone since when did you begin to feel this i inquired uneasily since well since we have been together again in the last month or two something seems to warn me that if we take what we want we shan't get it that's an irish saying i know but it expresses my meaning i may be little i may be superstitious unlike the great women of history who have dared but it's more than mere playing safe my instinct i mean you see you are involved i believe i shouldn't hesitate if only myself were concerned but you are the uncertain quantity more uncertain than you have any idea you think you know yourself you think you have analyzed yourself but the truth is hugh you don't know the meaning of struggle against real resistance i was about to protest i know that you have conquered in the world of men and affairs she hurried on against resistance but it isn't the kind of resistance i mean it doesn't differ essentially from the struggle in the animal kingdom i bowed thank you i said she laughed a little oh i have worshipped success too perhaps i still do that isn't the point an animal conquers his prey he is in competition in constant combat with others of his own kind and perhaps he brings to bear a certain amount of intelligence in the process intelligence isn't the point either i know what i'm saying is trite it's banal it sounds like moralizing and perhaps it is but there is so much confusion today that i think we are in danger of losing sight of the simpler verities and that we must suffer for it your super-animal your supreme stag subdues the other stags but he never conquers himself he never feels the need of it and therefore he never comprehends what we call tragedy i gather your inference i said smiling well she admitted i haven't stated the case with the shade of delicacy it deserves but i wanted to make my meaning clear we have raised up a class in america but we have lost sight a little considerably i think of the distinguishing human characteristics the men you are eulogizing are lords of the forest more or less and we women who are of their own kind what they have made us surrender ourselves in submission and adoration to the lordly stag in the face of all the sacraments that have been painfully inaugurated by the race for the very purpose of distinguishing us from animals it is equivalent to saying that there is no moral law or if there is nobody can define it we deny inferentially a human realm is distinguished from the animal and in the denial it seems to me we are cutting ourselves off from what is essential human development we are reverting to the animal i have lost and you have lost 
not entirely perhaps but still to a considerable extent the bloom of that fervour of that idealism we may call it that both of us possessed when we were in our teens we had occasional visions we didn't know what they meant or how to set about their accomplishment but they were not at least mere selfish aspirations they implied unconsciously no doubt an element of service and certainly our ideal of marriage had something fine in it isn't it for a higher ideal of marriage that we are searching i asked if that is so nancy objected then all the other elements of our lives are sadly out of tune with it even the most felicitous union of the sexes demands sacrifice an adjustment of wills and these are the very things we balk at and the trouble with our entire class in this country is that we won't acknowledge any responsibility there's no sacrifice in our eminence we have no sense of the whole where did you get all these ideas i demanded she laughed well she admitted i've been thrashing around a little and i've read some of the moderns you know do you remember my telling you i didn't agree with them and now this thing has come on me like a judgment i've caught their mania for liberty for self-realization whatever they call it but their remedies are vague they fail to convince me that individuals achieve any quality by just taking what they want regardless of others i was unable to meet this argument and the result was that when i went away from her i too began to thrash around among the books in a vain search for a radical with a convincing and satisfying philosophy thus we fly to literature in crises of the heart there was no lack of writers who sought to deal and deal triumphantly with the very situation in which i was immersed i marked many passages to read them over to nancy who was interested but who accused me of being willing to embrace any philosophy ancient or modern that ran with the stream of my desires it is worth recording that the truth of this struck home on my way back to the city i reflected that in spite of my protests against maud's going protests wholly sentimental and impelled by the desire to avoid giving pain on the spot i had approved of her departure because i didn't want her on the other hand i had to acknowledge if i hadn't wanted nancy or rather if i had become tired of her i should have been willing to endorse her scruples it was not a comforting thought one morning when i was absently opening the mail i found at my office i picked up a letter from theodore watling written from a seaside resort in maine the contents of which surprised and touched me troubled me and compelled me to face a situation with which i was wholly unprepared to cope he announced that this was to be his last term in the senate he did not name the trouble his physician had discovered but he had been warned that he must retire from active life the specialist whom i saw in new york he went on wished me to resign at once but when i pointed out to him how unfair this would be to my friends in the state to my party as a whole especially in these serious and unsettled times he agreed that i might with proper care serve out the remainder of my term i have felt it my duty to write to barbara and dickinson and one or two others in order that they might be prepared and that no time may be lost in choosing my successor it is true that the revolt within the party has never gained much headway in our state but in these days it is difficult to tell when and where a conflagration may break out or how far it will go i have ventured to recommend to them the man who seems to me the best equipped to carry on the work i have been trying to do here in short my dear hugh yourself the senate as you know is not a bed of roses just now for those who think as we do 
but i have the less hesitancy in making the recommendation because i believe you are not one to shun a fight for the convictions we hold in common and because you would regard with me the election of a senator with the new views as a very real calamity if sound business men and lawyers should be eliminated from the senate i could not contemplate with any peace of mind what might happen to the country in thus urging you i know you will believe me when i say that my affection and judgment are equally involved for it would be a matter of greater pride than i can express to have you follow me here as you have followed me at home and i beg of you seriously to consider it i understand that maude and the children are abroad remember me to them affectionately when you write if you can find it convenient to come here to maine to discuss the matter you may be sure of a welcome in any case i expect to be in washington in september for a meeting of our special committee sincerely and affectionately yours theodore watling it was characteristic of him that the tone of the letter should be uniformly cheerful that he should say nothing whatever of the blow this must be to his ambitions and hopes and my agitation at the new and disturbing prospect thus opened up for me was momentarily swept away by feelings of affection and sorrow a sharp realization came to me how much i admired and loved this man and this was followed by a pang at the thought of the disappointment my refusal would give him complications i did not wish to examine were then in the back of my mind and while i still sat holding the letter in my hand the telephone rang and a message came from leonard dickinson begging me to call at the bank at once miller gorse was there and talent waving a palm leaf while sitting under the electric fan they were all very grave and they began to talk about the suddenness of mr watling's illness and to speculate upon its nature leonard dickinson was the most moved of the three but they were all distressed and showed it even talent whom i had never credited with any feelings they spoke about the loss to the state at length gorse took a cigar from his pocket and lighted it the smoke impelled by the fan drifted over the panelled partition into the bank i suppose mr watling mentioned to you what he wrote to us he said yes i admitted well he asked what do you think of it i attribute it to mr watling's friendship i replied no said gorse in his business-like manner watling's right there's no one else considering the number of inhabitants of our state this remark had its humorous aspect that's true dickinson put in there's no one else available who understands the situation as you do hugh no one else we can trust as we trust you i had a wire from mr barber this morning he agrees we'll miss you here but now that watling will be gone we'll need you there and he's right it's something we've got to decide on right away and get started on soon we can't afford to wobble and run any chances of a revolt it isn't everybody the senatorship comes to on a platter especially at your age said talent to tell you the truth i answered addressing dickinson i'm not prepared to talk about it now i appreciate the honour but i'm not at all sure i'm the right man and i've been considerably upset by this news of mr watling naturally you would be said the banker sympathetically and we share your feelings i don't know of any man for whom i have a greater affection than i have for theodore watling we shouldn't have mentioned it now hugh if watling hadn't started the thing himself if it weren't important to know where we stand right now we can't afford to lose a seat take your time but remember you're the man we depend upon gorse nodded i was aware all the time dickinson was speaking of being surrounded by the strange disquieting gaze of the council for the railroad i went back to my office to spend an uneasy morning my sorrow for mr watling was genuine but nevertheless i found myself compelled to consider an honour no man lightly refuses 
had it presented itself at any other time had it been due to a happier situation than that brought about by the illness of a man whom i loved and admired i should have thought the prospect dazzling indeed part and parcel of my amazing luck but now now i was in an emotional state that distorted the factors of life all those things i hitherto had valued even such a prize as this i weighed in terms of one supreme desire how would the acceptance of the senatorship affect the accomplishment of this desire that was the question i began making rapid calculations the actual election would take place in the legislature a year from the following january provided i were able to overcome nancy's resistance which i was determined to do nothing in the way of divorce proceedings could be thought of for more than a year and i feared delay on the other hand if we waited until after i had been duly elected to get my divorce and marry nancy my chances of re-election would be small what did i care for the senatorship anyway if i had her and i wanted her now as soon as i could get her she a life with her represented new values new values i did not define that made all i had striven for in the past of little worth this was a bauble compared with the companionship of the woman i loved the woman intended for me who would give me peace of mind and soul and develop those truer aspirations that had long been thwarted and starved for lack of her gradually as she regained the ascendancy over my mind she ordinarily held and from which she had been temporarily displaced by the arrival of mr watling's letter and the talk in the bank i became impatient and irritated by the intrusion but what answer should i give to dickinson and gorse what excuse for declining such an offer i decided as may be imagined to wait to temporize the irony of the circumstances of what might have been prevented now my laying this trophy at nancy's feet for i knew i had only to mention the matter to be certain of losing her end of section twenty six